Uh, glad to have you tuned in tonight, and uh, we're going to start out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, one of the early epistles of the Apostle Paul that was written during the book of Acts, and I uh, just wanted to read a few verses here to kind of get the context of where we're going tonight. Uh, if you look in verse 7 of 1 Thessalonians 5, the Bible says, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for our helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. Now, those are interesting verses there, and, and I wanted us to look particularly at that verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. If you look back to chapter 4, in First Thessalonians chapter 4, this Apostle Paul is uh, talking there about uh, the rapture, about the catching away. And he says there in uh, verse uh, 15, For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, I want to talk to you about that subject of comfort tonight. And uh, the reason I want to do that is because I feel like it's real easy today, uh, maybe more so today than even in years past, to get really discouraged uh, about this message of grace and, and so forth. And the reason I say that is not that we would get discouraged about the message because we know the message is of God and the message works. Uh, when Paul said the gospel is the power of God to salvation, everyone that believeth, we know that's true. And we know that that's the only thing that's going to bring about salvation in the life of an individual is for that person to trust Jesus Christ, their Savior. So we're, we never get discouraged about that. We know that to be the truth. But I was chatting with someone this morning on Facebook, another preacher, and we were both kind of lamenting the fact that there are so many grace teachers today that seemingly have left the very basic tenets of rightly dividing and they're going back to more of a denominational approach to studying the Bible. And I think there's a reason for that. And I think the reason is primarily is, is if you mix the message of the, the kingdom program and the grace program, uh, or if you, if you deny the fact that the Apostle Paul was the first in the body of Christ, then it relieves some of the resistance that people have to the doctrine that we preach and teach. And so it lessens the suffering, if you will, uh, when you take that approach to the Bible. Now, in case you don't know what I'm talking about, there are preachers today that preach the grace message and at one time preached that the Apostle Paul, uh, the Apostle to the Gentiles, was the first man in the body of Christ based on 1 Timothy chapter 1, the verses there where Paul says that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. Now, what's interesting about people changing that position is that the verse still says what it says. It still says that in me first he might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them who should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So today, the, the seemingly the flavor of the month is to teach that the body of Christ started back there with Peter, James, and John. And it's the same church that Jesus Christ mentioned in Matthew chapter 16. And we addressed those things last week when I was in Kentucky at Bible study. Uh, we looked at some very specific things about the church. If you didn't get to hear that, uh, the, the message is online here. It's archived. So maybe you'll go back and listen to that message and then put these two together. Maybe it'll make more sense. But 
The fact is, is that there's an awful lot of people today that used to cling to the truth of rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, I, I saw a message link on Facebook two or three weeks ago. And I uh, clicked on that, and this man calls himself a grace preacher, calls himself a rightly divider. And he was preaching at a Bible conference down in South Alabama. In that message, that gentleman said that it was wrong to divide between prophecy and mystery. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because in Acts 3, uh, Peter says that those things that he was preaching were the same things that the prophet had said since the world began. Whereas Paul said in Romans 16, 25, that we preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Uh, this fellow went on to say that you shouldn't divide between Peter and Paul. Uh, he went on to say you shouldn't divide between the inheritance for the two groups because they're all one and the same. And I was somewhat flabbergasted at that, and I made a post on Facebook about if a person teaches those things, there's a good possibility he doesn't really believe in right division. I mean, what do you, what's left to divide? Paul said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we are to divide where? Between Paul's writings and Peter and James and John, the twelve and Paul, because that's where the change took place. Up until the salvation of Paul, everything that had happened was according to prophecy. After the salvation of Paul, what's happening in the end is that which was according to the mystery. And that's what Paul says in Romans 16. So the bottom line in all that is that when you've stood for these truths and, and you believe these truths and you see men who have in the past believed these truths begin to go back on that which they believed, it becomes discouraging. And uh, you, you see uh, people with, with little regard to what the Bible really says, and they take those same verses that they used to preach as truth and change words and deny the truth of the verses so that they can promote their own doctrine. Uh, so you say, well, what does all that have to do with comfort? Well, I believe today that if you want to have comfort it's not going to come through other individuals, even though there is comfort of those of like faith. But there is comfort from God Almighty. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We've been studying 2 Corinthians on Sunday night. And uh, I covered these verses in pretty good detail when we first started in 2 Corinthians. But there are some really wonderful verses. And I know we use these things in relation to when a loved one has someone pass and there's a funeral or whatever, uh, we think about those kind of situations of where we need comfort. But uh, Paul said, comfort one another there in 1 Thessalonians 5 and edify one another. And there is great comfort among those of like belief. There's comfort in people pulling together and striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, wherewith we ourselves are comforted, of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. So Paul says here that God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. I can say to you folks with all assurance tonight that when there is little comfort to be felt among other people, among brethren and so forth, God is the God of all comfort. He can comfort us in all our tribulation. And it is tribulation when people resist the truth, when your family turns against you or denies that which you believe and doesn't want to have anything to do with you because of your belief system, because you believe in salvation by grace through faith, you believe in rightly dividing the word. There's great comfort that comes from the Lord. So he said that God is the Father of mercies 
And he says that he is the God of all comfort and that he comforted us in all our tribulation. Now, notice what he says. He doesn't stop there. He said he comforted us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them with which them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You see, if you look down in verse 6, Paul says, And whether it be afflict, whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. So there is comfort that comes from God Almighty. And that comfort that comes from God Almighty, who is said to be the God of all comfort, he provides that comfort primarily through his word. Uh, look back, if you will, in Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. You see, when I hear things taught that I, when I, uh, on first hearing, I, they, they sound to me to be strange doctrine or new doctrine. I don't reject those things simply because the person preaching them is somebody I don't like. <laughs> That's not what we would do. We should never do that. We never reject or accept message based on a person's personality. We accept or reject the message based on whether it matches up with the Word of God. Now, I've got a book that tells me that Jesus, that the Apostle Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. I've got a book that tells me that the church of whom Jesus Christ is head is the body of Christ, the church, which is his body. And so I see a distinct difference between the church, the body of Christ, and the church at Jerusalem that was added to there during the early part of Acts. I see a distinct difference in the message that Peter preached and Paul preached. I see a distinct difference in the, 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 the ministry of, that was according to prophecy and the ministry which is according to the mystery. So yes, I'm going to divide in all of those areas and I also see a great difference in the inheritance of those that were promised the land, those that were promised the city, and those that were promised an inheritance far above all heavens. And in that, I see that there is a difference in those groups. And so I'm going to make a distinction in those groups. And so when I get discouraged or despondent because people that I have put confidence in in the past have now changed their doctrine, what I have to do is rather than simply attacking them, and I don't do that, I don't call names of people, and I don't attack people personally, but I try to expose the doctrine. Say, well, the Bible says to mark them. Well, you can mark people by exposing the doctrine which they teach. Now, in Romans chapter 15, notice there, in uh, verse 1, Romans 15, 1. The Bible says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now, I know that people want to take verses like that, verse 4, and they want to use those verses and say, see, the things that were written in the past were for our admonition and so forth, just like Paul's epistles are. Well, that's not what Paul's saying. He says, what things... Whatsoever things written before are written for our learning. Are we to learn the whole Bible? Absolutely we're to learn the whole Bible. Are we to learn all Scripture? Yes, we are. Are we to believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and so forth? Yes, we are. We're to believe all of those things. And we're to understand that the Scripture is the Word of God, and we should read and study all of it. But we need to do it in the light of what Paul said when he said, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. Now, he goes on there and says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience 
and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. You know, the one thing that we see about God's people is that God never forsook his people. I uh, say, so, well, Israel fell. Israel fell because of their rejection. But God Almighty never forsook believing Israel. Say, so, well, they died at the as martyrs' death. Yes, they did, but they died in hope. And the Lord promised them the hope of resurrection. You see, the comfort of the Scriptures has to do with the comfort that comes by believing the Scriptures. Why is it today that so many people are discouraged and despondent about God and about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because of people like Joel Osteen and Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland and uh, uh, T.J., whatever the guy's, Jake's last name, the uh, black preacher, and and the fellow out there in San Antonio, I uh, can't remember his name, John Hagee. Uh, yeah, I'm calling those names. Those men are deceivers. Those men teach people that they can claim the promises made to Israel. They can claim the promises to the church there at Jerusalem. Well, the promises to the church at Jerusalem were, Ask and you shall receive. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. I saw a lady that's a grace believer a while back put on Facebook that she was claiming John chapter 14 I think it was verse 12 or 13, uh, because she was praying about something. Well, John is not written to the church, the body of Christ. And can I say to you, you need to understand something, folks. The comfort of the scriptures comes through rightly dividing the word of truth. Do you think there's much comfort in somebody being taught that if they uh, will give enough money, that God will bless them? And then they give the money, and there is no blessing from God. There's no comfort in that. You think there's comfort in people being told, well, if you uh, pray and ask and seek God's face, he will answer your prayer. As a matter of fact, he's obligated to answer your prayer. And then you pray, and you have faith, and he doesn't answer your prayer. There's no comfort in that. You think there's comfort in people claiming the, the instruction in the book of James where he says, if any be sick, get the elders of the church, lay hands on him, pray over him, anoint him oil with oil, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. People do that, and the person dies anyway. Is there any comfort in that? No. You know where the comfort comes? The comfort comes through knowing the truth and knowing how God is operating today in this present dispensation. And that is one of the reasons why it is so important that we always and continually make a distinction between the church, the body of Christ, and the church back there at Jerusalem. Because there is a difference in those churches. They are not the same. They didn't have the same promises. They didn't have the same hope. They don't have the same doctrine. They didn't walk according to the same doctrine. While back there in the book of Acts, they sold their possessions. They lay them at the apostles' feet. They had all things common. Now, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, and you don't make a distinction between Peter and Paul, you're not going to be able to show things, those people those things clearly. Because if you say that they're the same, and then go over there and try to make a difference, all that's going to do is lead to confusion. We need to make a clear-cut distinction between the epistles of the Apostle Paul and the doctrine for the church, the body of Christ, and the doctrine that pertain to Israel and will yet pertain to Israel in the future. And when you fail to make that distinction, then you're going to end up in confusion and discouragement and despondency, and there is no comfort in that. But there is comfort in knowing that the God of all grace and his grace is sufficient. Look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we have a great illustration here of exactly what I'm talking about. Because you know as well as I do that the Apostle Paul, during the book of Acts, he had the power to heal. And yet we know that something changed. Now, sometimes people aren't quite clear what, but there is no doubt that by the time the book of Acts comes to a conclusion and Paul writes to the churches and to Timothy and Titus that Paul no longer has these uh, miracle sign gifts. 
Why he told Timothy to take a little wine for stomach's sake. Uh, Paul uh, was sick. He had other people that were sick. He was in prison. He didn't have that supernatural. You remember what happened in Acts chapter 16 when he was in prison? Why, there was an earthquake and the door shook and so forth, and he was released. He's in prison when he writes to Timothy, when he writes to Titus, and yet he's not supernaturally delivered. Do you know why? Because all of those things came to a conclusion when Israel had fallen. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, I became all things to all men that I might win some. He said unto the Jew, I became as a Jew. To those that are under the law as under the law. But there was a time when that, that program ceased of going to the Jew first and becoming all things. And that's when Paul writes, he says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, bond or free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. So you get over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, Paul said in verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, I, I know it's been debated for years that, uh, about what that thorn in the flesh was. Well, uh, if you just look at a couple of words, I think it's pretty easy to figure out. It is for me anyway. Uh, in verse 7, he says, The messenger of Satan was one that was given to buffet me. Now, look back in chapter 11. By the way, the word buffet means to beat upon continually. Back in chapter 11, Paul says in verse 24, Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches." Now, doesn't it make sense that the Apostle Paul, finding himself in this kind of situation, would pray to God that there be some relief? He said, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. You see, if there was anybody on the face of the earth that would have reason to glory, it would have been the Apostle Paul in the fact that he was chosen to be the Apostle of the Gentiles. Now, he said that we are the circumcision which put no confidence in the flesh. But Paul in his flesh would have had reason to, to glory in that he was chosen to be, and yet he says, all that I am, I am by the grace of God. But he says there, lest I should be exalted above measure, there was given unto me this thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And for the, he says, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Now, how are you going to reconcile that with Matthew chapter 7 and Matthew chapter 18, where the Bible says, ask and you shall receive. Paul asked for something three times, and God said no. He didn't give it to him. He didn't answer his prayer. Then I know that Paul didn't have the same promises in relation to prayer that the twelve had. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church at Thessalonica, said if a man should not, if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Well, Paul, uh, Christ told the disciples, he said, take no thought for your life, what you're going to eat, drink, or put on. So there is a difference in the doctrine. That's why we make the distinction, folks. And Paul, at the end of the book of Acts, by the end of the book of Acts, no longer had this power to cast out demons, to heal the sick, uh, to forbear working, and all those kind of things. And he said, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Now notice the Lord's answer. Because the Lord's answer to Paul is the same answer to us. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. You see, we don't have the promise that God's going to answer our prayer. 
We don't have the promise that God is going to supernaturally heal our bodies when we get sick. We don't deny that God has the power to do so. What we understand is we don't have the promises in relation to those things. And so Paul prayed for something knowing, no doubt, that there was a possibility he wasn't going to get it. And that's what he says. My grace is sufficient for thee. Now notice why. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see what Paul's saying? He's saying, when I am at my very weakest is when I learn to depend upon Christ the most. Listen, folks, when things are going bad in our life, when they're going bad in the ministry, when people are rejecting the truth, when people are turning away from the truth, we can always look to the Scriptures and be encouraged and know that God has not turned His back on us. God's grace is always sufficient. It is sufficient for every circumstance that we find ourselves in. And Paul says, Therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. You see, those verses right there are proof positive that there is comfort of the Scriptures. By rightly dividing the word of truth, we know and understand that the reason that God is not answering our prayer is not because we didn't give enough money. It's not because we're out of God's will. I mean, as a young man, I remember uh, that doctrine was taught continually that people that had problems and difficulties in their life, it was because they had sin in their life, unconfessed sin or that kind of thing. Well, there's great comfort in the scriptures that when things happen in your life, it's not, you can know for a surety that God is not punishing you. You know how you know that? Because we're living in the dispensation of the grace of God. God is not pouring out his wrath. Isn't it interesting over there in 1 Thessalonians 5 that Paul says he's delivered us from the wrath of God in relation to talking about this comfort? Let's flip back over there a minute in 1 Thessalonians 5 again. In 1 Thessalonians 5. I'll get there in a minute. I'm not using my regular Bible here, and it's uh, uh, kind of difficult to find these scriptures. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We read it a moment ago. Verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. <laughs> you find comfort in that? I do. It's a glorious thing to know that God is not exercising His wrath toward us. You know why that's comforting? Because we deserve His wrath. The things that we do in our flesh, the thoughts that we think in our mind are worthy of God's wrath. Why is it that we don't receive the wrath of God? Because God doesn't see us in our sin. He sees us in His Son, Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave Himself for us. You see, He says there, God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. Whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. That's a great comfort at the time of death of a loved one. Whether we wake or sleep, we're going to live with the Lord one day. And what does he say there in verse 11? Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. To edify is to build up. So what's the ministry of fellow saints? It's to build one another up. It's to comfort one another. How do we do that? Through the scriptures. How do we do that? By rightly dividing the word of truth. You can't do that while claiming promises made to Israel when claiming things that were not yours in the scriptures. Uh, look, if you will, back in Colossians uh, chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. In Colossians chapter 4, notice there in verse 7, Paul's going to mention some people that were very important to him in the ministry. 
He said, All my state shall Tychius declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant of the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who to one of you, I'm sorry, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister, son of Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandments. If ye come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. You see, you can either be a blessing and a comfort to people, or you can be a discouragement. And when people teach false doctrine, they are not bringing comfort. They might bring a tickle to the ear. They might bring an exaltation in the flesh. They might settle that desire or, 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 or quench that desire for some new thing. But the only thing that brings comfort is the truth of the word of God rightly divided. Knowing who our apostle is and knowing the differences between the church, the body of Christ, and the church that Christ formed through the nation Israel. Knowing the difference in our inheritance. Knowing the difference in the message of Peter and Paul. Knowing the difference in all of these things is what brings peace and comfort. Don't ever turn away from these basic truths. They're the things that bring comfort. So there's the comfort of others. Then look back in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, verse 8. Paul says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end you may be established. Now notice, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. You see, there's great comfort in the mutual faith that we have one with another. Uh, that's why the local church is very important. That's why Bible study groups are very important. Because those groups I have to do with people coming together and they have a mutual, that is a like faith. And when you have that mutual faith and you're in agreement one with another, then there can be great fellowship and there can be great comfort that we get one from another. God is the God of all comfort. Christ is the comforter. He told the disciples, he said, I'm going to go away. When I go away, I'm going to send the comforter. It ended up in the Holy Ghost. You know how the Holy Ghost ministers us today, ministers to us today? It is through the written Word of God. We know the things of God by the Spirit of God that dwells in us. And as we read and study God's Word, those truths are imparted to us through the words on the page. And when we believe those words, there is comfort that cannot be found anywhere else. Uh, just a couple of other passages. Look over in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, we're in Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> Notice there in verse 1, Paul says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, 
and one nine. You see, there's where that mutual faith, that that comfort of love, that comfort of like faith, of mutual faith comes in. And we can rejoice in having those people to fellowship with. And sometimes it's through maybe the internet ministry. Sometimes it's through physically meeting together. But there is a great need for continual fellowship among those of like faith. Now, are there things that happen where we get discouraged? Yes, there are. But you know what? I heard a football coach say this past week, and I know it's a kind of a, I forget the terminology for words when they're uh, repeated often. Uh, but this particular football coach said something I've heard time and time again. But it's a truth that everybody needs to always remember. And that is, in relation to people that turn from the truth, in relation to those who perhaps have stood for the truth and you put your confidence in and now they've turned away. Got an email the other day from a lady and she was listening to one of the preachers that's preaching these things I uh, have been talking about. Uh, this man now says that Paul was not the first member of the body of Christ. And he says the body of Christ terminology was made up by the religious system. And she was devastated because this is the man that originally taught her the truth. But thanks be to God, she puts more confidence in the word of God than she does that individual uh, simply because he's the one that first taught her. But she was upset about that, as she well should be. But here's the thing. There are things that we can do nothing about. And most of the time, we spend most of our time focusing and fretting over things that we can't change. So, well, maybe you ought to call them up and talk to them. No, uh, that's not that's not the solution. The solution is for us who believe the truth, stand upon the truth that we've always believed, is to do exactly what Paul told Timothy to do, and that is preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove and rebuke with all long suffering. And when you get discouraged and despondent, the devil is always there trying to hinder you from doing the work of the ministry. There is nothing he would like better than to stop you from doing what God's called you to do. And it doesn't take much for some people. But I can tell you, over 35 years as pastor of Grace Bible Church, there's always been that nucleus of people. And we've had times when we've had as, as many as over 100 people there just recently. Uh, now it's dropped off again some. But the fact is, is that the size of the crowd doesn't determine the validity of the message. And if what we're preaching is true, it's true whether people believe it or reject it or walk away or, charge, charge, uh, or cause a church split or whatever, the truth is still the truth. And yes, we have a lot of junk and crap to deal with when people resisting the truth and causing problems. But come on, we don't have anything that would compare with what the Apostle Paul had. Just go back there and read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. How many times have you been beat? 29 times. How many times have you ever been stoned? How many times have you ever been shipwrecked? How many times have you ever been where you didn't have food to eat? You see, it's real easy for us to get on a pity party and begin to feel sorry for ourselves. But come on, folks, think about this. We're part of what God's doing today. And if there, are want, or if there are those who want to deny the truth that God so clearly laid out in his book, then so be it. That's between them and the Lord. I feel certain these men are still, are, 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 I still believe they're saved. But here's the thing. I can't control what they teach or what they believe. And if they desire and they decide to believe that, then there's nothing I can do about it. But you know what I can do? I can take every opportunity to preach and teach the truth of the Word of God so that people can hear and be established in the truth for this present age. And that's what we need to do.
Don't ever accept or don't ever reject doctrine based on the individual teaching it. I know some men that I disagree with totally on certain issues. But I hear other messages they preach that I glean great information from. I'm not going to reject that teaching if it lines up with the Word of God simply because I don't like them or I don't like their other teaching. It all comes down to one thing, folks. That's the book. It's the Word of God. That's where we put our confidence. That's what we look to. That's what we trust in. And we prove things by the Word of God. And we don't go back and try to make verses say this to fit our doctrine and come up with a doctrine and then build the Scriptures around it. We take the Word of God and we acknowledge and understand that uh, we have a separate and distinct apostle for a separate and distinct age, for a separate and distinct body. And we have the most glorious truth in the world today in the gospel of the grace of God that that the apostle Paul called the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said that we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power might be of God and not of us. Don't ever give up. Don't ever quit teaching. Don't ever quit preaching because people continue to get saved by the grace of God. In spite of all of our shortcomings, God is still doing what he promised he would do, and that is to save every individual that will believe the truth of the gospel and trust in what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. He said he died for our sins that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And he'll save anybody that will believe that. And listen, that's what evangelism is, putting that message out there clearly, simply, with all simplicity, and whether people believe it or not is up to them. But don't ever go back on the truths, the basic truths, of rightly dividing the word of truth, because that's where a real comfort comes from. Do we get discouraged? Sure we do. Do we get despondent sometimes? Do we get upset that people don't believe like we believe? Sure we do. I know people listening right now, you have family members that you would give anything in the world if they believe like you did. I I know I went through that. I went through it with my parents. I went through it with my family. But you know what? There's nothing I could do about that. So what did I do? Say, well, I'm not going to preach anymore because people don't believe the truth. No, you don't quit preaching. You don't quit. You don't close your church because people disagree with the doctrine you teach. If you really believe it, you'll teach it and preach it no matter who believes it or doesn't believe it. And that's the stand we ought to take. And the only way you can be strong in that stand is by continual study of the Word of God and rightly dividing the Word of truth. I appreciate you tuning in tonight. We'll